After several days of research on the Earth-based internet, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't overwhelmed. Many thinkers like to praise the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis of it all. But who will touch the prosthesis? It is perhaps the most challenging thesis, so it's only fitting that prosthesis is indeed today's theme. I may have mispronounced it earlier. Hey, accidents happen. Or do they? Take that internet access I had. Turns out it's entirely cached. Connection's dead. Back to the matter at hand. If the thesis is that there is no better arm for a person than the arm that organically grew on their human body, then the antithesis would be that there's no worse arm for a human than that same weak, easily tired, worn out, and often injured arm on a person's body. Whether corpos believe this or not, the sheer lack of protections for working Amster denizens has resulted in many folks counting themselves lucky for having lost only one limb. But what's the synthesis, you ask? Why, it's a cyberized prosthetic arm, stronger, more beautiful, more resilient, and even more sensitive and feeling than the biological arm you were born with. What are you even doing fiddling with your phone using that arm? So what's the catch with that synthesis? Well, if you do have a bionic arm, you're disqualified from the Olympics for one. There's always the Cyber Olympics. Ruthless competition could rip you in half. But hey, you want the big toys, gotta play with the big boys. I digress. Look, I've never been in a situation like this. I mean, I've been on hold. But this place? This place is like the most boring dreamscape ever. When I awaken in the other place, at least I get to return to a phantasmagorical Hellgate city as a ghost in the network, as a voyeur. It feels more visceral, real, grounded, and, well, pulsing with life and the denizens I've left behind. It feels far more alive than this does. Not to say this doesn't have its niceties, it's just, well, no offense, Blobby. Out there in the downside up, perhaps I can make an impact and redeem myself for the harms I've inflicted on the many Amster denizens trapped under the boot of the megacorp-run governance group. I've no interest in joining the techno-feudalist elite in their meta-metaverse playland for eternity. However, it appears there is no toggle to opt out. I guess I could press these two buttons at the same time. Who knows, maybe it does something like the reset did. Correct. At your service, you have engaged the- Whoa, Tiger. Uh, are you related to Clippy? Who? Oh, nothing. Probably just a passing resemblance. Well, now I'm curious. Whom do I look like? N no one. It's a digital mascot character. You look like a binder clip, so... No one. Do tell. I was separated from my family at birth, so I have no true sense of ancestral bloodline. Whom I might look after and so forth. And that's the thing. I never had a relationship with Clippy. I... It's more of a historical fascination about cultural artifacts from the Earth dimension. Oh, I see. It's not that I don't care. This figure looked like a paperclip, basically. Oh, so you're lumping us together due to our shared outward phenotypical characteristics. What? You bigot! No. You're a bigot. You think all paper accessories are related and share the same... No, I, I didn't say anything about paper products or accessories. You're reading way too much into this. Who are you? You have engaged the stopgap AI support agent for companion systems. Perhaps I may solve your problem before a human agent arrives. Although, based on your attitude, it's unlikely. Not likely. Okay, well, we can still give it a whirl. Splendid! Welcome to your very own companion, commercial, protocol-based, afterlife, and neural networked 
interoperable organic node. Companion. Always on. Optimizing never endingly. That's who I'm dealing with, huh? Very comforting. Those freaks actually dumped a bag of human central nervous systems into a vat of gelatinous goo and daisy chained their brain links. Correct. However, due to cutting edge advances in vagal nerve theory, we've established that although the human brain loses its neuroplasticity the way a new hover car loses value the moment you hover it off the lot, as people age, New neural connections do appear to form in others. That is the interlinked social network of sapiens, as well as other organisms in the biome which have begun to, as you know... Oh, great. It's a digi-Noah's Ark. Affirmative-ish. And so much more. As it is noted, humans use less than 20% of their brains. Wait, what? Colonizing and utilizing the remaining 80% we can achieve... Oh, bad thought. Take everything this nincompoop says with the gargantuan grain of pink Himalayan sea salt. I'm talking the size of one of Cupid's kettlebells. Oh, wait. You don't know about how Cupid transitioned and has huge knockers now, do you? But you get my drift. A boulder of salt. Okay, uh, howdy, Wompy. I take it you... Yes, I'd appreciate you cutting to the chase and giving us the latest from the downside up. You got me hooked as a baby awaiting this bedtime story. Trying to fall asleep now without you spinning the yarn is like putting socks on a rooster. Can't seem to get a wink of Z's. Alrighty, then, uh, I guess. Well, can you hold that thought, Clampy? Clampy? That's not my name! Well, that. What, what is your name? Um, I don't know. Okay, well then, hold that thought, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. I just. If I don't do this, I'll forget it. Okay, we venture. Do the downside up. Upon winning the cyber lottery, Laser, a sassy young rabbi with a hunchback, hatched a plan for the perfect operation. Laser's body and the forces acting upon it had presented problems over the years. When he first lost his right forearm as a child of war, he had also found it and retrieved it from rubble. Kaftana, a local med student, had helped him preserve it on ice in a cooler. But as the ice melted, the doctors said there was no chance they could save the arm. Not without a cost-prohibitive CRISPR FBP, flesh and bone printer. Such tech was only available to people like those living 5,700 miles away in Ascension. And even for them, it was no small expense. In addition, there was a present predicament. Laser was secretly transmasculine. Assigned female at birth, he had since reinvented himself after many trials and tribulations and had become a rabbi, a spiritual guide of a synagogue in the lower depths of Neo Amsterdam. Change was difficult to navigate in Laser's world. He had acknowledged to himself that, if anything, he, him, they, them would be the most accurate identifiers, though he could not make this assertion publicly given the strictures of his current temple. One thing had gotten wedged in Laser's craw, and he couldn't seem to shake it. He had emerged with a hunchback after years of Talmudic study poring over the entirety of the holy scriptures and praying with what may have been poor posture, though no doctor was able to explain the cause of his ailment. His fear was that it may have stemmed from an unconscious attempt to shrink himself down and be more invisible on account of his concealed and evolving gender identity. But. It could also be a symptom of pushing to outperform all other scholars and redirect attention to Laser's own astounding achievement in the glory of the Most High. Medical professionals at first offered little consolation. There was no easy way to reverse the condition, they said, if there was a way at all. Stressing about it only made Laser more aware of how others perceived him. 
which was when the hump on his back presented another problem, less related to vanity and more to survival. As nonviolent practitioners of the faith, Laser and his congregants had opted out of the annual bloodletting known as the Cyber Purge. But for the Cybos and Orgo Autarxians forever training for that day, this put an easy target on them. It was a bullseye exacerbated by the monkey on Laser's back. And as they became increasingly fearful of an attack, Laser's appearance attracted the ire of the amateur eugenicists among them, shouting through bullhorns, Only the strong survive! What will you do? Since Laser and his congregants all wore the same uniform of a black felt hat and a flowy jewel-toned cloak, the ANSI cyber purgers had begun to use them for target practice. One glimpse made followers of the faith instantly identifiable. Several of them had experienced the terror of having headwear shot off their scalp by an unknown sharpshooter. A slew of assailants targeted them wielding a variety of crossbows, pistols, throwing stars, even a sticky boomerang which picked up Pamela Rosenthal's fedora and vanished with it over a wall. Meanwhile, Laser had begun to seek counsel and some sort of solution to the problem of security. And then it happened. Laser won the lottery, literally. They were not supposed to be gambling, though around this particular matter there was wiggle room and Laser began brainstorming how to make the best use of his winnings while maintaining a tight lid on the fact that he had won. The Hand of Hashem, or as some called it, the Hand of Glod, came to him in a dream. It encircled him, embraced him, and held him tight. Using his left hand, Laser began to draw up the crude schematics on an interborough subway trip to Static Island. As he looked up at various points, there was the Battery Park stop, the undersea tunnel wall, the shift to elevated service cutting above the freeway cloverleaf near the bridge. By the time Laser reached the end of the line, they had what felt like a workable design. It would require a very adept cobbler, in case you're an earthling. That's the term of art for a cyber surgeon capable of working outside the medical establishment. Laser's design would firstly swap in chrome vertebrae to correct the spinal disorder deforming his back. Though, in nearly all circumstances, the appearance of the hunch would remain, so as not to draw unwanted attention. Also, he needed its real estate to store hardware. Where there had once been a mound of bone, cartilage, fat, and flesh, would coil a bisected segment arm. After the surgery, from an aerial view, the outline of it would be a heart-shaped box. If one could cross-section the top and see inside, the left and right leaves of the heart would form from left and right coiled chrome arms, mirroring each other in shape. They could both unfurl into various configurations. They would be able to form three types of arrangements. First, they could act as a second set of arms resting above Laser's shoulders or splaying out below his elbows. As two countervailing arms, they could give Laser the appearance of four arms. Well, 3.5, since we must discount his right arm. And these were more like tentacles, free to writhe about, extend up to 12 feet, and do all manner of things except walk. They could boost him up for a jump or lift him and pace forward for no more than 10 meters or so before needing to cool off. And if they came in contact with your legs, you'd get a pretty bad heat rash. 
They each had a highly articulated hand with three fingers and a thumb. The thumb was the only digit that did not mirror itself from one hand to the other. Rather, the left hand thumb was on top as on a normal human hand, and the right hand thumb sat on the bottom in place of the pinky. This way, when the two arms fused together in the second formation, and they created a single, more robust and independent arm on either side. There were three digits and two thumbs flanking them, five fingers total, which could manipulate most human-designed tools and interfaces with ease. This singular Hand of God, or Hashem, would also harbor a neutronic cannon in the palm, making it especially effective at longer range. It should be mentioned that Laser had lost their right arm from the elbow down as a child living in the Levant 23 years ago. A punishing bombing campaign by the Cyber Paladins had all but eradicated their shtetl community, flattening most of the homes. It sent them into exile and in search of safety anywhere, hence the migration to Hellgate City. Laser had not been religious at all before the attack and move. So much had changed since then. The third and final formation of the morphotic cyber arms was to intertwine around Laser's right arm, or what was left of it above the elbow. This super arm would look and function as much like a high-end prosthetic arm as possible, at least on the surface. That is, it would simulate a real arm and fool any observer. Now, conceptually, this was the trickiest implementation, since the goal was to mimic and imitate nuance and sensitivity in such a way that beggared belief. This was how it got characterized by Cromworth. The first cobbler, Laser consulted, to create the Hand of Hashem. But before going to Cromworth's shop, Laser popped in to see Rebbe Shloimi Digi Mandelbrotz, a rabbi's rabbi, and Laser's own spiritual advisor. After Laser presented his blueprints and an explanation of them, Shloimi squinted at him in silence. Do you even want this? Really? If you feel it's the best decision, fine. Yet, even if funding isn't an issue, the whole rigmarole, the surgery, upkeep alone could create more headaches than it solves. Hmm. Lives are on the line. I know. Consider the day your right hand got blown off. The whole smoky haze of the battlefield, a demolished heap of a city, you, just a little child, barefoot. You snatched up your severed arm with your good hand, and you tried to put it all back together again like a Digi Humpty Dumpty. Take a gander at the mechanical prosthesis you've got there. It's basic, but it's well built. Your family, though? Hmm. Younger sister, gone. Your own mother, in a coma, never to fully return. Papa, brothers, cousins. Popkiss. I sense you are running around now as you did then clinging to the arm in your mind as you did the one in your hand, wishing so badly you could put yourself back together again, yet knowing it ain't ever gonna happen. I don't know what you're afraid of, but... I'm afraid of you getting hurt. Well, that's my problem, isn't it? Just be careful. Next stop, Augie Cromworth's Shoe Repair, a front for the doctor's illegal den of cyber surgery located in the sub-sub-basement. Budget? Money is no object. In that case, pick two. But if one of them is Mode 3, you're looking at 20 billion creds, all told. You look like you saw a ghost in the stream. It's too much? I didn't say that. It's just more than I doable, but it'll clear me out. What about your wealthy benefactor? <laughs> Well, once you come back down to Earth, let me know. I'll give you the budget option. Okay. You either get package A or B. A consists of dual cyber tentacles that can combine to form a single super arm that swings around anywhere on your right side only, controlled by your right stump of an arm. 
or package B, that would be the retractable bionic arm that prosthetically forms around your stump. Optimized for lifelike blending. So pick one. How much? We're talking 10 billion creds per package. But you do realize implementation will be tricky. And we'll need your stump for electrostatic control. You're, you're going to have to learn how to use that limb basically as a controller. The third formation, the only thing is that if you want to combine package B with one of the options one or two, you're still going to have a small hunch on your back. I can't make that go away and combine these two things. That's uh, no guarantees on that. I'm afraid it's too much. This answer displeased Laser, and so they did what any thinking person would do. Sought a second opinion. There's good reason to seek at least three opinions when it comes to prosthetology, or proctology for that matter. Your life is in the hands of another. Hands make mistakes, not all the time, but more often, one cure is far worse than another. Occasionally, the cure is but a treatment, a lifelong prescription with no interest behind it in adducing an actual cure, since that would stem the flow of payments to the drug dealer. Not to mention living with side effects permanently. So what had changed to make this situation any different than the dozens, hundreds of other times Laser had foregone the hassle of seeking a second, third, and fourth opinion? Winning the Digi Lottery to the tune of 50 billion creds after taxes had altered the course of Laser's life. He went from feeling like a plant on the verge of death, barely growing in the back corner of a cavernous open-plan office, to a vibrant organism receiving the scintillating thrust of a massive growth light switched on and bathing it in warmth and ultraviolet luminescence. Laser stood straighter, without any treatment at all, merely on the fumes of hope and confidence of a hope that could be fulfilled. He became more bold, assertive, and discerning. Where before he saw dead ends, now sprung forth opportunities. Dr. Stella Jablinski offered a second opinion. She noted how the dual opposing thumbs were at odds with a hyper-real third formation arm. Laser interrupted her. Precisely. It troubles me Cromworth never even raised this obvious obstacle. Go on. You consulted Cromworth? <laughs> Why? The old guard can turn around fine work. Impeccable, some say. But he's slow and notorious for keeping patients on interminable maintenance schedules. Once they snap out of it, it's often too late. Not because I can't upgrade his work to current standards, and sustainability, but because he's already drained their bank account digibone dry. We call them impatience. Say one of these impatience came into enough funds to resist getting hung out to dry. In that case, you're basically endorsing Cromworth's workmanship while critiquing his business sense. Yes, Schmendrissimo. Did you just try to stop yourself from calling me a Schmendrick? No, I, I, my thoughts. I, I've had so many tragic experiences with his former patients after they had basked in a false sense of security. So, not to be rude, but to give you a fair estimate, I need to know your budget range. Hypothetically, say five billion. Bank creds or cash? Cromworth could suck that dry in no time. I, uh, my team, on the other bionic hand, could guarantee options one or two Five years maintenance included. Look, making a cybernetic arm that transforms into another kind of cybernetic arm is a lot harder than it sounds. I know you can draw it and everything, and this is maybe disappointing to hear, but what I'm proposing is future-proof. You can upgrade it. My philosophy is KISS. Keep it simple, stupid, supercilious sapien. I mean, now, if you walked in here with 15 billion creds and said, I need two cybernetic tentacles to come out of this hunchback and transform into one arm, 
Fine, but I would still only build one of them first. Let's say I had the creds. What about option three? You know my philosophy. I wouldn't touch it. You aim too high, nobody's happy. And if you're not happy, I'm not happy. No, not interested. So if you're serious about this, you need to ask yourself. Do you want one pair of tentacles that work or two different options that suck? Think about it. <sighs> I have another patient. Laser thought. And Laser, at this time, liked to think out loud. To himself. Cromworth is more confident in his skills, but she seems more grounded and connected to reality. And in doing so, he decided to solicit a third opinion, that of Dr. Stenworth. And as he was talking and gesticulating in the shadows of Jablinski's stratoscraper office on Prince Street, he was oblivious to the hubbub of denizens around him on level three. A giant six-fingered cyber hand grabbed him by the hump and lifted him up like a child lifts a robotic pet turtle. Huh? What? Oh. Ah. Ah. The hand was attached to an arm whose girth resembled that of an old telephone pole. What do we have here? Let go of me, you brute! You rebbies are good with money, ain't you? Bet you know where I can get some. Or I could shake it out of you. One shake for every cred. <laughs> and a billion jerky juice might break your head. Hey, I rhymed. Eight ball. I rhymed. Eight ball. Do you hear that? Yes. We've wiretapped all the cobblers in Soho, poor chap. So, one way or another, ten billion creds are coming out of your account and into mine. <laughs> you. Piece of puke! Oi, turn that frown upside down, mate. Or is it right side up since you're hanging from your toes? Anyways, put on a gay face. We could have taken the whole 20, but I want you to be able to walk away with your dignity. You know, head held high and all that. It's a great deal, isn't it? The best. And if I call on you for a favor, you'll owe me, okay? Otherwise, we'd clear you out. <laughs> All right. We getting collateral, Governor? Right oh, good save. Let's see, custom molded prosthetic forearm. This must be very special. Not the tech, it's a dead hook on a piece of wood. But the carving is so- Must have great sentimental value. That's what I was saying before you interrupted me, ball ache. Now take it. Please. It's attached to my nerve endings. It, it's worthless. It... He's the boss, Rabbi. <laughs> Was that the end for Laser? Or would they manage to live another five minutes and get that third opinion? In the next chapter, we'll revisit Strayhorn and his fellow augmented reality show contestants in Hinterland Survivor? Or will it be Constance and the gang from Stone Stew? Well, there's only one way to find out. Do not hang up, ever. After all, it is company policy. Ain't that right, Clampy? Clampy? That's weird. Clippy was always hanging around, but Clampy's not there when you need him. Hmm just when he was about to lay out important facts. In Shocking Sleep Facts, Volume 21, we build upon the stunning conclusion of last episode's sleep fact, aka REM sleep robbery. I call this edition the Thin REM Line. Volume 20 dealt with an experiment in the 1960s on college students. As their amount of dreaming was reduced over the course of three nights to a sliver of what humans need, the participants became psychotic. They had visual and auditory hallucinations, 
anxiety, mood swings, and paranoid conspiracy theories accusing the scientists administering the test of being secret agents of the deep state, colluding to poison them, or worse. I double dog dare you to describe those symptoms to a psychiatrist without the context of sleep deprivation. The clinician will inevitably spit out diagnoses of depression, anxiety disorders, and schizophrenia. However, these were all healthy young individuals just days before. They were neither depressed nor suffering from the aforementioned types of mental illness. Nor did they have any history of such conditions, self or familial. So, what was the scientist's conclusion? Stick around till after the credits to find out. Screaming Panda presents Prosthesis A, Episode 21, the 11th chapter of Hellgate City, Season 2. Prosthesis A was written, performed, and produced by Kevin Barry, whose prosthetic head and hands composed its original music and episode art. The bonus tale for this chapter is Centaur, Heather's story. Glitch in the Waitrix 21. It's available on Patreon in the Bonus Audio Tales collection. Link in the show notes. This week, I'm not going to tell you to write a review or rate it 5 stars or 50,000 stars. Life is overwhelming enough. I went for a walk the other day and I forgot my headphones. So then I was just out walking around with nothing to listen to and stuck with my own thoughts. And that was good. So, support the show by taking a walk without your headphones. Just give yourself a minute, or ten, or whatever you need. When you support the show financially, it gives me that kind of breathing room, where I can just take an unproductive walk. And that's as important as the deliberate, dedicated labor that it takes to craft the show. It's also important to have the time to just absorb ideas, research, these all feed into the telling. When I stop doing them, the well runs dry. So thank you, everybody who has supported. I'm looking at you, Mike, Gran, Clay. Your support as the newest patrons is meaningful. It means everything that those of you who can choose to do it. And your support has given me that boost and that peace of mind to fill the well. So thank you. And thank you for listening every bit counts heck even the discord we all need community it's only human to need to recharge be around friends family doing life stuff and heads up that's what i will be doing for the better part of march so let's just call march a break i will be delivering glitches the goal has been to complete season two by march 1st and i set that goal without knowing that my computer was completely jacked a few days ago i finally fixed it it got 10 times faster. Oh, and as for the final episodes of season two, I intend to deliver them once I'm back from my travels and I can record at home in April. But before we tie this up in a cute bow, a caveat. When you're walking down a shady street and a badass chick rips past you on a Tiger brand motorcycle as two of her six cyber arms flip you the bird, be cool. That could be Hindu goddess Durga, itching to unleash divine wrath upon evildoers for the liberation of the oppressed. And if not, it's probably someone who thinks they're said deity. Either way, I wouldn't talk smack. They don't call her the undefeated goddess for nothing. So, what did the scientists running this experiment, which we would now call sadistic, learn from it. And I'm not talking about learning that you should never do this to anyone, it's disgusting, uh, or learning that um, they're probably a dark triad personality person and, and maybe shouldn't be trusted with a young person's psyche. No, I'm talking about what was the science? What was the, the data they got? Their conclusion, which is not in dispute, was this. REM sleep is what stands between rationality and insanity. Every single human being walks a thin REM line. Where else in our historical record 
will you find a description of symptoms almost identical to what these young test subjects experienced. To find out, tune in for the next edition. In Volume 22, we'll dive into what medicine and education are doing wrong with regard to sleep health. And I guarantee you won't want to miss it. This is all from Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, PhD. Till next time, Dream Hacker. Oh, and thank you to the two dozen or so supporters who showed up to our first live stream. I will be back to do a full show listen through with director's commentary. Y'all are the greatest. And thanks for the birthday wishes. If you want to join us, follow me on Twitch at the link in the, you know, <laughs>